Hey everybody, it's me. And today I want to bring you guys a video that's pretty special and important to me because I want to start a movement. But before I get into the meat and potatoes of this video, I just want to give a special shout out to Captain Kodachrome and Ghost Storm. You two individuals know who you are. Uh, they are theories that you two have mentioned in your videos and or the comment section. And once it's explained within the context, you know which one applies to you more. So I just want to give a special shout out to you, uh, you two. I um, also want to give a special shout out to the newest subscribers. We're almost at 9K and soon we're going to be hitting 10K subscribers. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. But in order for this movement to be properly coordinated, I feel it's very appropriate. I feel that it is a necessity that I give people that don't know this information, this information. So I'm going to be summarizing the, br I'm going to be briefly summarizing the history of the Crash Bandicoot series. So you guys get an idea of where I'm getting at and why this all makes sense. The first five Crash Bandicoot games were published by Sony Computer Entertainment. Universal owned the character and Naughty Dog developed four games. Eurocom made Crash Bash, which was the last PS1 Crash game. In 1999 with CTR, the fourth Crash Bandicoot spinoff title, uh, when Naughty Dog and Universal's contract expired, Naughty Dog didn't want to extend the contract, so in turn, this resulted to the Crash series going to different developers, starting with Crash Bash, as I just mentioned. Eurocom, not Naughty Dog, Eurocom made Crash Bash, and after Crash Bash, we got Wrath of Cortex, which was on the GameCube, the PS2, and the Xbox. And from there on, Universal still owned the series, and the Crash Bandicoot series continued to be on multiple platforms besides PlayStation. I'm not going to keep stressing the fact that Universal owned Crash Bandicoot. Not Sony, not PlayStation. They didn't own him. The reason why Crash Bandicoot was known as the unofficial PlayStation mascot is not because of slang, not because of a nickname, not because of some weird name or whatever. It's because Universal owned him. They owned the series. However, he was literally the unofficial PlayStation mascot. He was the Mario of PlayStation because he was the series that really made the PlayStation 1 as successful as it was back then. So, Universal went from being known as Universal to Vivendi later in the PS2 lifespan of the Crash Bandicoot series. And then they eventually morphed into Sierra. And then after Sierra, in 2008, or, excuse me, in 2010, Activision got the rights to the series. And Radical went defunct, so they couldn't make any more Crash Bandicoot games. What I'm getting at is, is the fact that Crash Bandicoot was a multi-platform series. Crash Bandicoot was on more Nintendo platforms than PlayStation platforms. He was on the GameCube, the Game Boy, the DS, the Wii, and now the Switch. What I'm going to add on to this is the fact that when the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy was announced for the Nintendo Switch at the Nintendo Direct this year, there were some keywords that were mentioned. And those keywords were, we're making the impossible possible, meaning that the original trilogy is on a Nintendo console. No one ever thought that would happen, but now it's happening. And when you fast forward to E3 with the Super Smash Brothers Ultimate presentation by Masahiro Sakurai, his main priority for this game was to make the impossible possible. Why is it that the Insane Trilogy being on the Nintendo Switch in this Smash Brothers game, why is the main goal to make the impossible possible? I just thought that was interesting. That was by Ghost Storm slash Captain Kodachrome. But going back to the E3 thing, notice how at the Super Smash Bros. Ultimate presentation there was a tournament afterwards. Sakurai was already in LA in preparation for the tournament. And as you guys know, E3 and Activision's uh, headquarters are close by. They're in the same state. Which means, in theory, Sakurai could have went to Activision, approached them to use their character in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate before actually telling us or revealing us that he's in the game, if he's in the game, you know, to be in or whatever. So, there's a possibility that he's already in the base roster. But if he's not, then let's get him in as DLC. Now, it has been confirmed that if there's demand for a new Super Smash Brothers title, Sakurai will work on it. He said that himself. 
But I honestly feel like the man needs to take a break. I honestly feel like we don't need a new game after this, at least for a long while. However, if he's willing to make a new Super Smash Brothers title after Ultimate, who's to say he's not willing to make DLC for the Ultimate Super Smash Brothers game? There's Mario, and there's Sonic, Mega Man, Pac-Man, Solid Snake, and Cloud Strife. Very iconic characters. But there's one missing, and I honestly feel like it's Crash Bandicoot, because back then, he was Mario's second rival right next to Sonic. No one just likes to talk about it or mention that for some reason. They like to forget about it. But it's true. In fact, the first Crash Bandicoot game outsold Super Mario 64 at one point. If you go back and read the reviews, they made it perfectly clear that that, that was one of the negative three points. You're not Nintendo. Um, and we overcame that over time. You know, Crash outsold Mario. Yeah. Uh, and over time, people started thinking of Naughty Dog not as this upstart underdog that was somehow discrediting Miyamoto because we weren't at all. A good game does not discredit another fantastic game in any way. The history is definitely there. And Solid Snake and Cloud Strife rarely appeared on Nintendo platforms. But think about it. As I mentioned earlier, Crash was on every single Nintendo platform but the Wii U and N64. And he's now on the Switch, which further proves my point. And if he has a stronger history with Nintendo, then why shouldn't he be in the game? Why is it hit or miss for him being in the game? Cloud and Solid Snake only heightens his chances of getting in, if I'm being honest. One thing that I will also mention is that PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale, a game, a PlayStation Super Smash Brothers, essentially, released five years ago. And you would think with the title, PlayStation All-Stars, you would get the characters that made your company as successful as they did. However, Crash Bandicoot or Spyro weren't in it. So if Crash Bandicoot wasn't in PlayStation All-Stars, as well as Snake and Cloud, and those two are in Super Smash Brothers, why isn't Crash outside of anything besides its series? Besides Skylanders Imaginators. I'm talking the biggest crossover series ever. Why isn't he in Super Smash Brothers? I feel as though it'd be a missed opportunity if he wasn't in Super Smash Brothers. I feel like he's deserving of a spot. And anyone that disagrees, that's perfectly fine. I don't really care. But you can't sit here and say that Snake and Cloud fit, but the second rival to Mario doesn't. It just doesn't make sense. You can say it's your opinion, but logically it just doesn't make sense based on logistics. So I just wanted to say that. But with that being said, and all of that information being digested into your system, I'm going to leave you off with this. Man, your worst nightmare has arrived. Pack up your stuff. I got a little surprise for you here. Check it out. What do you think about that? We got real time, 3D, lush organic environments. How's that make you feel, buddy? Feel a little like your days are numbered.